Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Entrepreneur Experiment podcast with me, Gary Fox. This is our first interview of the new season and we're kicking off with an absolutely massive episode. I am chatting with Ushin Hanrahan, the CEO of Angie. Ushin started Handy and raised over $100 million before being acquired by Angie. It's an incredible chat. We chat about how he started back here in Ireland moved to the States, how he started Handy, raised all that money and then sold and then went on to become the CEO of the company that actually bought him. It's an incredible story. We chat about many things. We chat about leadership during COVID, which I personally really wanted to dig in with. They have over 5,000 employees in the States. So managing that many people during a time of turbulence, I found massively interesting. We talk about what it's like to be an entrepreneur and have your company scale up to such a level and then get acquired. So I Chad, really want to dig into it and find out what's it like to build a company like that and then to be bought. And then it's so unusual to see an entrepreneur get bought out and then become the CEO of the company that bought them. An incredible chat, really enjoy it. First, I want to say three quick thank yous to my three new partners for season seven. It's incredible to be supported by entrepreneurs who symbolize everything that your podcast is all about the three entrepreneurs behind these three companies are incredible entrepreneurs. First up, we have Sean from Find a Venue. It does exactly what you think it does. It helps you find a venue for your event. If you work in a company and you're constantly organizing events, conferences, parties, all that kind of stuff, you just need to talk to Sean. It's as simple as that. You go to findavenue.ie and they will help you do everything. They'll source the venue, they'll handle all the logistics, all the messy stuff that takes up ages. And the best thing of all is it doesn't cost you anything. It's free to use. So if you're a corporate event planner within a big company, go and talk to Sean at findavenue.e. They also launched Zoom Party during COVID. So if you're not back in the physical event space of organizing in-person events yet, they'll still sort you out with Zoom Party, which will help you organize a virtual party for your entire staff. So they got you covered, no matter what you're trying to do. Next up, we have Chapter. Deirdre and her team at Chapter are 360 degree branding specialists. So what does that mean? Essentially, they will do everything for your brand. So whether you're starting a brand new brand, a brand new company, they will help you from concept, making that better, figuring out what it is, what, what you stand for, what your principles are, right up to a final product, whether that's a final product on a shelf or a whole overall branding piece for your company, they will help you. Or perfect time to look at your brand over the last couple of years, things have changed massively. So if you have a brand and you feel it could do it a little bit of a refresh, a little bit of a rethink, Deirdre and her team will also help you with that. So if you have a budget to spend on your branding, on your marketing, just go and chat to Deirdre and the team at Chapter. That's chapter.ie. Finally, our third partner, this is an exciting one. Bay Street Innovation. Gareth and his team at Bay Street will help you with all your technological needs. So if you're a startup or an SME and you want to really achieve your potential through technology, Gareth and his team will help you on a wide range of areas, specifically two very interesting things. If you have a lot of mundane practices, we all have them, the repetitive things you have to do every day, the processes you have to follow, Gareth and his team will help you identify what they are, flesh that out and see, can they be automated? And if they can, he will design you a full end-to-end -end system that'll help you automate the entire process. That sounds unbelievable. Secondly, and this one would really have appealed to me, I've been a non-technical founder in a technical business. It's tough, right? We didn't have a technical partner, didn't have a technical founder. We we're constantly kind of searching for that solution, Gareth and his team will be that part of your company. So if you're a non-technical founder and you're looking for technical expertise, they will actually come in and consult with your company and help you figure out what the technical offering will be and they'll then help you build it from start to finish. So that's Gareth and his team at Bay Street Innovation. Go check them out. If you're watching on YouTube, welcome. This is our first interview series on YouTube. All the links are in the bio below. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, all the links are on all my social media pages, mrgaryfox.com, also on the website, mrgaryfox.com. Go check all them out and support them if you can. Three great Irish businesses. Now, 
let's get on to today's interview with Mission Mr. Oshin Hanrahan, the founder of Handy, which was later sold to Angie, and he is now the CEO of Angie, Mr. Oshin Hanrahan. Oshin, welcome to the pod. Good to be here. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. We just had lots of pre-pod chat. Hope we didn't use up all our good stuff in the uh, in the intro. I misunderstood. I thought we were live immediately. <laughs> well, you were so so relaxed. So we can we can recreate that. Welcome to the pod. It's brilliant to be chatting to you. Where are you in the world? I am currently in South Carolina. Uh, normally, I would be in New York, but I am uh, I'm escaping COVID and down in South Carolina with my wonderful wife and two kids. What is life like in South Carolina? Hot, humid, sticky, relaxed, uh, filled with Zoom most days. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's different in New York. It's definitely different to Dublin. How'd you pick South Carolina? Uh, escapism. We, we, we were early, uh, we were early uh, escapees from New York uh, when, when COVID first hit. So I had... Um, at the time, wife and a one-year-old, and uh, they they shut down the or we shut down the our office, and it was at that point it was my wife and I both working uh, with our one-year-old in the in the apartment, and uh, we we had a small amount of, uh, of, of of childcare to help us out, and suddenly our apartment was not large enough, and we uh, we escaped uh, escaped COVID. Uh, by looking down the, the, the map of America and rapidly trying to find a place that was still available on Airbnb or uh, Verbo or whatever other site we used. We rented a place down in South Carolina and then we rented another place uh, and then we ended, up, uh, we ended up buying a place down here uh, uh, on, a very, uh, on, a, on what I would call a very disorganized trajectory. Uh, <laughs> more serendipitous and convenient than a, a large part of the life plan. If you told me two years ago that I'd you know, have a place in South Carolina, I would have taken the under on that bet. <laughs> well, it looks like you like it. If you bought, it looks like you might be there for a little while. Look, I, I, I think we were, we were more looking for certainty at the time. We're, we're you know, yeah. very, very hopeful that we get back to New York uh, very soon. I think we're, we're you know, obviously COVID, Delta, and all that, uh, that, that uncertainty is... Uh, Back, uh, back in the mix, uh, are, are, we're hoping to get back to, to New York for uh, for Labor Day, so that folks can, uh, you know, start to normalize again. I think we all hope to, to, you know, to get back to a slightly more normal world um, in uh, in September. So bring me back, fingers crossed. Before New York, bring me right back to Dublin. How did you end up going from jumping from Dublin to New York to South Carolina? Bring me way back to where it all started. Way back, yeah. So I grew up in Dublin, grew up in Rathcool. Um, I uh, went to college in Dublin and then I uh, spent some time in Budapest and Hungary uh, d doing real estate development, construction for a few years. Uh, and then I spent a little bit of time in venture capital in London and then moved to Boston to go to business school, did a year of business school uh, and, then, uh, and then dropped out to start Handy. Um, we, I started Handy with a co-founder and the idea was how, how do we change how people um, how do we change how people buy everyday services so you think about you know handyman uh, you know a plumber um, and we, we thought hey for simple tasks you should be able to just press a button and book a service uh, and we started that business uh, in 2012 um, and the 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 thesis was people are going to book these services online so people are going to go online and say, hey, I want to, I want to book a handyman for X number of hours, and they'll put in their credit card and they make the booking. And back in 2012, uh, that looked slightly crazy. Um, yeah, I was going to say genius now, but back then, must be pretty, I, I don't know pretty about out genius, there. Genius, but I, I go with obvious now. 2012 looked looked like we might have been, you know, uh, might have been drinking a little bit too much the night before. Um, or had a little bit too much coffee that morning and got a little bit too excited. Um, but that's, you know, I mean, you, you think about the context, you did have Uber taken off kind of back then. You had Airbnb that was, you know, uh, definitely in the mix. And we said, hey, people are going to book these services online. And we, you know, we had that thesis and we, we started handy and we built it for six or seven years. 
built it out across the U.S. Um, and ultimately sold it to Angie, um, which was uh, you know a, a, a larger platform um, that was more lead gen. So it was more like a listing service where you'd connect uh, with pros or connect with plumbers and painters and carpenters. And we put the two businesses together. And more recently, I took on the 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 CEO. Well, first I ran product there, and more recently I took on the CEO role at uh, at Angie. And Angie's a um, Angie's a sizable operation. It's you know, Five thousand people that work on uh, work for us work with us every day. Uh, we got a quarter of a million service pros that work on the platform doing the the, the work. We got you know, twenty million homeowners that choose the platform every year, um, and we're you know we're we're, we're still you know, uh, we're still at a point where the market's enormous. It's you know a, a massive market. It's five hundred billion dollars in market, um, and we make up less than two billion bucks of it. So wow. big but small. Bring me back to starting handy because Crunchbase has a graveyard full of marketplace startups that seem like really good ideas, but never got the escape velocity to get out of that initial stage. How did you achieve that? Mm. Look, I, I think one of the things um, one of the things that's important uh, for me is. Uh, figuring out what that thing is that you believe to be true that the rest of the world might not have realized and being almost bipolar in how you approach that. So for me, that was writing down on a page, Hey, I think people are going to book services online. People are going to book home services online. Um, and once we had that written down, we, dedicated 99% of our effort to just trying to prove or disprove that, um, that, that thesis or that fact. And, you know, we, we had this, uh, we, we had this meeting that we, you know, we'd have once every two or three weeks, my co-founder and I, we sit down and we say, all right, are we any closer to actually proving this? Like, are we any closer to proving this is going to work? Do we have more customers or fewer customers? Do we have, you know, more pros, fewer pros? Do we have, uh, um, you know, more or fewer signs that uh, that this might actually work. And that was 1% of the time. I, I don't know if it was 1%, but it, I remember it was an hour. It was on a Friday. It was every couple of weeks. Um, but other than that, other than that one dedicated moment where you're saying, okay, this is where we're going to like look at the facts in a cold light of day and question ourselves, the rest of the time we were like guns blazing, hey, this is going to work. And we're going to 100% prove this to be true. Um, and I think that mentality um, is, 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 is something that's helped me a lot. It stops you spinning your wheels. It stops you, you know, everyone needs a moment to question whether what they're doing is right. The problem is you need to shrink that moment to productive time, as opposed to every time there's a setback or every time, you know, uh, you know, a, a booking goes off the rails or, you know, a partner, you know, rejects you or a business, you know, an, an investor says, no, do you question the whole thesis all over again? No, you, you set aside dedicated time, or at least that's what we did to go through that, like questioning, let's look at the facts. But the, the rest of the time it was like guns blazing, this is happening. And we're placing zero doubt on, uh, on this thesis that people are going to book services online. And so I, I think that was, that was one thing. Um, it, it was like a, a structural setup that we had in terms of how we were operating and a mentality to, 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 to focus. And I, I see a lot of founders, like, you know, th there's this like, uh, um, kind of, uh, balance that founders need to strike where they, they need to figure out how to take feedback from people. Cause everyone's giving you feedback all the time. Everyone's mm -hmm. like telling you, Hey, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? And you don't want to be so headstrong, stubborn that, you know, you don't listen to anybody at the same time. You don't want to waver in the wind and like, Oh, flip flop, you know, maybe have you thought about doing it this way? Have you thought about doing it that way? Um, so I, I, th I think that's, um, that's an important thing for founders to, 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 to figure out. And how do you filter that, that Oshin? How do you know how much to take on and how much to kind of go, mm, interesting, but you know, we'll keep going. Um, I, I mean, I, I think for me it was, um, it was whether or not the, uh, the feedback questioned the underlying thesis. So if it questioned the underlying thesis, it was like, all right, well, we'll deal with that in the like one hour a week that we've set aside to, gotcha. to question the thesis. If it was tactical, it was like, 
And by question the thesis, I mean, you know, maybe we should take bookings by phone. Have you thought about doing it by phone instead of taking them online? You're like, no, don't. That's not part of the game. Let's let's not let's not build a phone booking service uh, on on day one. Um, whereas you know, um, you know, questions around or uh, suggestions around which categories to be in or suggestions around pricing. That's all super valid feedback. Um, I, I think another um, another thing that was was helpful early on is we shrank the surface area of the problem small enough that it allowed us to stay focused. So we didn't try and do every category day one. Mm -hmm. We, you know, focused on two categories in a couple of cities. We didn't try and, you know, uh, spread ourselves way too thin. Uh, and I think that again, gave us, um, that gave us confidence to, 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 to really push on, on, it gave us confidence to really push on the direction that we wanted the business to go um, because we could focus our energy on a, on, a, on a small enough space. We knew the market was huge. It wasn't about us taking the whole market uh, immediately. Was it hard and to fill the, both sides of the funnel? Sorry, Ashin. Was it hard to fill both sides simultaneously? Just as you're saying that, it seems quite logical. You know, a couple of cities, a couple of categories. But was it hard to fill customers at one side and supply at the other? Um. If you rewind to 2012, the world was in a different place. So uh, we were, we were, you know, the other side of the, the the cliff of 2008, 2009. But we certainly weren't in the roaring mid-teens of you know 17, 18, uh, where you know unemployment was dropping precipitously. So unemployment rates were reasonably high. Um, we had done some early testing on. What does it look like to try and get pros? Um, and we, we, we had a funny one. So we were, we were both in business school and uh, we, you know, the first time we were looking for pros, we put up a couple of ads and we said, hey, you know, uh, handyman wanted, I can't remember, was it 20 bucks an hour, 15, 20, 20 odd dollars an hour. Uh, and we got hundreds of responses to these ads. Uh, and we sent, uh, we were like, all right, well, let, let's see, you know, we don't really want to get into the phone, phone uh, uh, kind of screening business. Instead, you know, what we'll do, we'll, we'll try to do this by text message. So what we did was we sent text messages to a lot of the folks saying like, hey, can you show up for a, an in-person interview tomorrow at 9 a.m.? And uh, we, I think we sent it to like, 150 or 200 people not thinking that many of them would show up it was more like a test um, we went over to uh, we, we uh, uh, the, the business school we were in has a had a you know fancy schmancy innovation lab with lots of glass and chrome and you know people working on whiteboards uh, and we you know we, we said okay well why don't you show up here at this address and we gave the address and we gave the time and we thought maybe we'd get 15 20 of them to show up and we walked over, uh, we were walking over from our apartment, my co-founder and I, at whatever, 8.50 or 8.55 the next morning. Uh, and we saw a bit of a commotion outside this, uh, this, this innovation center. And we saw people being like turned away. And it was, you know, uh, it, it was all sorts of people, people in suits, people who, you know, looked like they, 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 they might've been out in the town the night before, uh, people parking cars on the curbs. Um, and, uh, Everyone kept saying, we're here for the handyman interview. And I was like, oh my God, those people might actually all be here for us. Um, and as I got closer to it, I, sure enough, I, I could hear lots of people shouting, I'm here for the handyman interview. Um, and uh, I, I walked up to the security guard and I said, hey, this 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 might actually be my fault. This this might be my problem. Uh, and he said, well, you're going to, you're, 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 do you, do you go to school here? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. He's like, well, you're, you're going to hear from the, the dean later on, like, this is going to be a problem. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and sure enough, I mean, the, 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 the thesis worked, you know, the, the people wanted to respond to text message. They were okay to like engage. And again, it looks, sounds obvious today in, you know, 2021. Yeah. Cool. You text people that you don't know, they might show up. I mean, we, you know, we, we were effectively proving the scalability of the model that, um, pros would engage and would show up for an interview or for work without us needing to, you know, get on a phone, describe the job to them first and yeah. yada, yada, yada. So it was, 
you know, I, I think that gave us confidence that if we got the consumers, um, that we'd be able to get the pros to do the work so long as we had the work at a reasonable price, reasonable time, reasonable location. And it gave us confidence to go out and, uh, and, and market to, to customers knowing that we were going to be able to backfill the jobs. And that was, you know, a core part of uh, the, the, the early handy, uh, the early handy way of doing things. It was let's test things. We'll see what works. We lean in and if it doesn't work, we, we won't do it. I love that. That's such a powerful lesson to see that a massive company can grow out of even the smallest test because we get mm. that quite a bit. A lot of entrepreneurs say, well, I just tested. I put up, you know, dummy websites in the cities that I wanted to target and just put up ads and ran them. And then if people clicked on it enough, we just launched the product there. And it seems so logical, but so few people do it because they get stuck in that kind of phase of mm, what if though. And, and going back to your original point, they would spend all the time thinking about the one hour where you guys just put it down to, okay, test the thesis for one hour and then execute. I think a lot of people get stuck on the other side. They flip at 90, 90, 10. Yeah, look, I, I think um, planning is really expensive. <laughs> I, I think not a lot of people realize how expensive planning is. And uh, most, most decisions, this has been said so many times before, most decisions you can reverse them. They're not that expensive. It's actually more expensive to spend the time sitting around, wondering, pondering, planning, wondering what happens if X, what happens if Y. There are certain decisions that are really expensive and you should really you know, consider, do you wanna do X or do you wanna do Y? Because they're hard to reverse. And those are the decisions you need to spend time on. But everything else, you know, I, you know what, one of the things that I, give feedback to the team on is like, Hey, what, what are you working on right now? Like, well, you know, you see, you know, five people, you know, well, you, you used to see five people in a conference room planning. Now you don't see them anymore because they're on zoom, but, um, you know, you'd see five people in a conference room planning and I drop in and say, Hey, what, what, what are y'all working on? Like, what's, this looks like a pretty serious planning session. They're like, well, we're wondering whether to do X or Y. And I was like, well, those don't seem like things we should be wondering. Just test both of them. Like it, all of your time is incredibly expensive. It'll cost you as much to build it, build both versions in the, the lightest way possible and just test them um, as opposed to trying to figure out. And, you know, there obviously are, you know, certain infrastructural decisions, certain product things that will be really expensive to go and uh, to go and build and, and get right. But the lightest versions of them, just test them and see if they work. We don't, you don't need to spend a bunch of time figuring it out. Just test it and see if it works. Did you keep that model going then, that, that thesis going in your early couple of years with Handy? Oh, I still, you know, pre-COVID, I would still walk into random conference rooms and ask people, you know, you know, you know with thousands of people, I will still mm -hmm. randomly walk in and be like, hey, well, what y'all working on today? It looks like a lot of whiteboard. It looks like a lot of whiteboarding going on. If he comes by, look is, really busy. <laughs> yeah, I hope this is a really big decision. They're like, well, you know, we're trying to work on the, the, the purchase flow for this. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm going, well, well, what are we debating? We're like, oh, we're, we're thinking about this one or that one. Like, ah, just test both of them. <laughs> what shade of blue should more. the button be? <laughs> uh, if, no, if anyone ever spends time debating that, my goodness. <laughs> um, it's more common than you think, I think, unfortunately. So the first couple of years are handy. What was, what was the journey? Bring me through the first couple of years because they're often the most kind of tumultuous, but often the most fun as well. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it was about launching cities. It was about figuring out product market fit. It was about recruiting uh, people. It was about raising money. Um, you know, we, we raised a, a, a good chunk of money. Uh, what, what at the time was a good chunk of money, now I don't think it's a good chunk of money anymore. I think everything is like, if you don't raise a gajillion dollars now, um, you know, what, what's the point? It, it seems like every... Uh, it, it seems like every startup now raises uh, raises an, an enormous amount of money right out of the gate, um, but it, it, uh, it yeah we, we went through I think four or five rounds of funding, uh, brought on great investors, uh, and really focused down on, uh, on on building a great team to support the customers, support our pros, and we scaled from a couple of cities to uh, you know I think. 30 or 40 cities, and then ultimately all across the US um, in cleaning and handyman in a direct to consumer model where you could go to handy.com. Originally it was Handy Book, and then we rebranded it to Handy, spent far too much money to buy a domain. I was just going uh, to ask you, lose. that sounds like a pricey domain. 
it wasn't cheap. Yeah, um, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a cheap one to lose four letters and spend a boatload of money. Um, but look, I, I think you, you you take a point of view on what you want your brand to look like, what you want it to sound like, um, and. You know, I mean, we, we, we just did it again with Angie recently. We we, uh, we we spent, well, we didn't. We actually owned the, the Angie domain, but we lost an S, an apostrophe, and list, and we took it from Angie's list down to Angie. Um, or, sorry, we lost an E and S. Oh, my goodness, I've, I've, I've forgotten how, how to spell. Um, but, yeah, we, we took it down to Angie.com, which was, you know, similar to taking HandyBook down to Handy. And, Look, I, I think it was the same thesis at the time. It was the same argument. We didn't want a literal name. Um, literal names are, um, they kind of constrain what you're doing. They, you know, if you wake up every day and you think, hey, we're handy book, you think, hey, we're only about booking. We're mm. not about getting the job done. Or you think, you know, hey, we're a, we're a list if we're Angie's list. And we're like, hey, we're, we're not a list. Um, it's one thing if your literal name describes what you do. Like you're in United Airlines, you're an airline. Yeah. It does exactly what it says in the tail. It's, it's, it's Ron Seal, right? Um, whereas, uh, you know, if your literal name doesn't describe what you do, it can kind of box you in. So we made the decision to rebrand from handy book to handy. Uh, we kept recruiting folks. We, you know, built out, uh, built out a leadership team, the business scaled. We had to change out the leadership team. I think a lot of, a lot of, uh, early founder work is spent on culture and values. So we, we rolled out some values. We built a values deck for handy. I think it's you know, still kicking around online. Um, and, uh, it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun, extremely stressful, but, uh, a, a lot of fun. What was the, there's probably multiple per day, but in the early years, what was the biggest challenge you faced? Look, I, I think any business that's, um, any business that's still burning capital, um, is in a constant fight for survival. So you're in this model of, hey, we're, we're burning money every single day. We're in a fight for survival. And the, the biggest thing is to maintain the culture and set of values that you want to build while saying no to the vast majority of things. So the vast majority of things, the answer is no. Um, because it doesn't, on the timeline that you've got with the capital that you've got, doesn't fall in the, the, the spectrum of things you're, you should be working on. Um, and it's saying no to things, maintaining that focus on what the right thing is uh, for the business to be doing. Um, and that's hard. Um, it, it's hard to, you know, it, it's easy to say no and be a jerk. It's hard mm -hmm. to say no to most things um, and keep people focused. Um, while also building a sense of empowerment, building a, a you know a, a set of culture or a set of values and a culture that you want to build, um, and I think that's um, you know that that's 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 probably the hardest thing. Like you think through the the activities of a CEO or a founder, it's making sure you you got the resources, so making sure you got enough capital, making sure you got the best people possible, so going out and recruiting the smartest possible people, setting a vision for where you're going. And, you know, making sure that that vision is consistent, setting the tone, setting the values and culture, and then, uh, and then making sure that you're, uh, explaining to people internally and externally what you're doing and why, so that people have the context. And, you know, all of that comes back to, um, all of that comes back to being responsible enough to say, uh, to say no, um, a, a large amount of the time so that. Uh, so that people are, are, are focused on the right things and whether that's no to, you know, cultural behavior or values that don't quite fit, whether it's no to, you know, deals that you don't want to do, whether it's no to expansion opportunities, whether it's no to, you know, new ideas. Um, it, it's, 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 uh, it, it, it's just one of the most, uh, the most, it's one of the most important things I think for, uh, for founders and leaders to do. Is that a learned behavior? Or is that something you get through years of experience as a founder? The more time you've spent doing things, the the more you will realize um, how costly distractions are, mm -hmm. and how the difference between having a small number of things you're doing and you're talking about them all the time and they become self reinforcing versus having a very large number of things that you're working on and people are, you know, off on the sidelines getting distracted, you know, a, a well-functioning team 
focused on two or three things can accomplish an enormous amount. You start to, you know, uh, you start to tack stuff along the side and suddenly they, you know, you just put grit in the wheels. Um, and I, I think you can, th there's definitely pattern recognition where you can see, oh, we've, we've put some extra stuff along the side of this team or along the side of this business and now they're not, you know, laser focused on the most important things. Um, and you see it in terms of, uh, you see it in terms of what people are talking about, you know, when they want to get up at all hands and talk or what they present on, um, you know, what they get excited about. If your team's not excited about the core things that you want them to do um, and that you think are important, then you've, uh, you, you probably missed something along the way. Talk to me about your own personal focus. How do you maintain focus? I have a list I have a list of five things that I'm working on for the year and I start my day by looking at that list of five things and then I look at my calendar and I go through my calendar and I ask myself whether any of the things on my calendar could even remotely possibly move the needle on those five things and then I do an exercise of removing things from my calendar which drives my assistant absolutely crazy because she asks the question, well, why didn't you remove this yesterday? Or perhaps, <laughs> perhaps you could never have agreed to put it on in the first place. Awkward um, email and incoming. Then, and then I will, uh, I, I will probably do the same thing for the next few days. Um, but it, it's a, it, look, the, 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 most, um, the most valuable thing you've got is time. So it's how are you spending your time? When you look at your list of five things, you know, and mine's inside my, I, I keep a notebook with me, mine's written inside my notebook. So I look at my notebook, open it up every morning, I look at the five things, and then I look at the calendar, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm really, like, I'm at, like, a 20 or 30% hit rate here today okay. in terms of, like, my, you know, 10, 12 hours of the day, how many of them I'm putting into uh, the, the most important things. And on the best weeks, you know, it's in the 60, 70, 80%. Um, on the worst, it's like, oh, man, this is, like, in the 10, 20%. Um, and it's, it's not that... It's not that hard um, to to know where you stack every single day. Like you can literally look at your day in you know, fifteen or thirty minute blocks. And um, you know, I'm fortunate at this point where uh, fortunate or unfortunate, depending on how you look at it, where my day is relatively structured. And at any minute of the day, it's got like a, a block on it for what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and that uh, you know, and some some of those blocks are just hey, like let's 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 go look at a uh, you know, what's our strategy for next year or what's our plan for this year for, for a certain business. Um, and uh, I, I think that simple tool holds me to account on whether I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and uh, I, I think most people, uh, you know, if, they, if you ask them whether they're working on the most important things, they'd probably say, yeah, 70, 80% of the time I'm working on the most important things. You ask me, am I working on the most important things? I can tell you maybe 40% of the time I'm working on the most important things, which at least I know, um, which... And you honestly <laughs> know, it's not like, mm, I think so. It's no, so I, the accountability piece is huge there. It sounds so simple, what you just said, people will go, oh yeah, it's very simple, I thought he'd have some secret bullet, but it's the piece that, where you say, you look at the calendar and go, is that moving me towards the five things? Talk to me about the five things, how do you formulate that list? Um... On the one hand, uh, it, it's really important to be to be judicious and like be incredibly thoughtful. On the other hand, I I, I mix it up, right? Uh, I've got um, so actually I have two lists. I have a personal list and I have a professional. That list. That was my so next I question. Have, You're way ahead of me. Yeah, yeah. So I've I've got a personal list which is you know uh, it's around spending time with family and friends. It's around. Uh, fitness goals, it's around development goals. It's like, hey, here are the five things that I want to do for me personally. Um, and then the, the the business list is, all right, here are the five things that I want to happen in the business. It's I want this business to go from X to Y. I want this one to go from Y to Z. I want to create this capacity. Like, it's, yeah, it's five things. Um, and I think in your, in your business, I think early on it's harder to pick the five things. Um, as the business matures, they, the, the five things probably, the first three probably become much easier. And then mm. four and five, you're like, hey, 
I should probably be a little more discretionary with them. Um, but I, I try, I try to make them year long. I try to say, Hey, you know what, if I was to end 2021 with these five things having happened, like how would I feel? Um, and I'd be like, I feel pretty good. In fact, you know what? I feel great. Um, if I did these five things in 2021, uh, and you know, if, uh, if I make progress on them and you know, I, I, I try not to, um, try not to reevaluate them on any like short-term cadence, probably halfway through the year, I'll have a look and say, Hey, are these five things, the right five things, but I'm looking at them every morning. Like I know they're the right five things. Yeah. If I, if, if I made one of them like a, you know, a short-term thing, then it would drop off the list because it would, uh, it, it, we probably accomplish it. So, and then the, the, the personal ones, it's, um, you know, it's, it's about the balance of, you know, I think before I had kids, uh, it was, uh, it was about me and my, you know, me personally and my relationship with my wife. And now that I have kids, it's like, all right, well, I got, you know, I got three different layers of that. It's like, Hey, what the heck do I want to accomplish? What do I want from my relationship with my wife? Uh, what do I want from my relationship with my kids? And then what do I want in terms of my relationship with my friends? So I, I kind of think about it on those, um, on those layers. I love that. I really like that. We usually get that, uh, dig into that at the end, but I'm glad we got to talk about it now. Bring me back to when you sold Handy. How did that all happen? What was that process? Was that your kind of goal from when you started or did it come out of left field? Um, I, 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 these, the, there's, a, there's a famous, uh, or I think it's a Hemingway quote, which is like bankruptcy happens gradually and then suddenly. Yes. Uh, and then I all think the ones, sales yeah. processes are, are, are similar to that. They happen very gradually and then incredibly suddenly um so year four or year five at, at handy we started uh we started some major partnerships well what were then tiny partnerships but grew into pretty pretty significant partnerships with uh, retail partners so you could go to uh, a walmart store and buy a tv and right there in the in the store or online uh you could add tv mounting services um or furniture assembly services or any range of services um uh, and they would be provided by handy um i remember reading about that at the time with, it was genius such a great move um so it, that was one of the things that uh i said no to early on uh and and uh, turned out i was wrong um so I, that was one of my no's that turned out. Actually, I should have said yes to that one. <laughs> but you got to yes um, in the end. That's all that matters. Yeah, we got to yes in the end. <laughs> um, uh, so I, uh, we, those partnerships started to work. Like they worked pretty much immediately. Um, and we, once they worked, once one of them worked, we doubled down on it pretty quickly uh, and, and built up a team. And I spent a bunch of time on, on, on building those relationships. And you know, that led to some interesting conversations where some of those retail partners were, were, were interested uh, and, uh, you know, explored, uh, wanted to explore an acquisition. Uh, and that kind of put the business, uh, put the business in play. Look, we'd raised a bunch of capital at the time. Whenever you've raised capital, um, particularly from external funds, it's, it's, it's only a matter of time before those, you know, wonderful people also would like you to wonderfully return some of the money. Um, and that requires either a public market event or uh, an acquisition or some sort of alternative uh, alternative financing. So we we ended up in a conversation uh, with the like I said a number of retailers, uh, and um, I had a relationship with uh, with uh, with Joey at uh, at IAC, who's the CEO of IAC, which owns a good chunk of Angie, and. Uh, uh, he, you know, every year or so I would have met him and, you know, talked about how Angie was doing and how Handy was doing. And he said, hey, actually, if you're thinking of doing something, uh, we, we'd also like to, to to have conversations. So then it, 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 you know, progressed pretty quickly from there into term sheets. And we looked at our options and, uh, and decided that uh, decided that Angie was a great fit um, for, for the business and decided that. Uh, we could really get excited about what we wanted to do, could really get excited about the scale that they had versus where we were, um, and uh, went through a, you know, a, a process to argue over how many, how many, uh, how many gold, gold coins we'd get and you know, what the terms would look like and, and all that fun stuff. And I think the lawyers you know, consistently build us extortionate amounts of money to, to get through it. And, we, we debated whether the extortion amount was right and uh, came out the other side and we're very happy. 
How did you feel about that at the time? As obviously you're a founder, CEO, Handy. How did you feel about being bought out? Just exhausted. I mean, you, you, <laughs> the the process of uh, the process of selling the business um, is so all consuming that you don't have the emotional bandwidth to really process any of what's going on. Like, I think going into it, you start to get, I think early in the process, you have more emotional bandwidth to think like, hey, do I really want to do this? Is what, this what I want? Yada, yada, yada. Once you get over that initial hump, which you haven't processed very much during, you haven't like really, uh, really gone through like the, the full process of like, what does this look like? You're just so, certainly in our process anyway, so overwhelmed by the volume of uh diligence conversations that happen like there is you know there's diligence for everything and uh the process is you know on, on the one hand thorough on the other hand perhaps designed to wear you down um and you know there there's you know, you're on phone calls with your you know one or two people on your team because obviously you got to keep running the business because everyone's not in the loop and for every call you're on there's you know a dozen people on, on the opposing team who are experts on the topic. You know, you're on a call on sales tax, you're on a call on mm. income tax, you're on a call on leases and, you know, liability and employment liability and benefits liability and, you know, online security validation and PII and payment processing. And there's just like, there's a, there's like a, a series of calls for every single work stream and you're just so completely uh, consumed by the process that you have no emotional bandwidth to deal with any of it. Um, this is what you don't hear about. You always hear about, oh, and it's sold <laughs> for X hundred million. <laughs> you just, I imagine you just diving into gold, the gold coin, Scrooge McDuck style, just back, back, <laughs> just swimming around in circles, just spitting the gold coins out. <laughs> so it's not yeah. like that. Oh, you burst so many bubbles. Maybe that bit, maybe that bit happens after. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you're 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 just exhausted by the process and um you know I, I think it depends where where you are in the journey right if you're if you're at a point in the journey where perhaps you've got you know i think handy was small at the time i think we had you know 150 people maybe so you know it would have been a big deal to loop in any more than two or three people or four people to help with the process i think we i think we had a small team of five actually myself my co-founder uh someone from finance someone from accounting and someone from legal and i think that was it Wow. Um, okay. But, you know, for every single like line item and diligence, you know, if you're selling to a sophisticated seller, um, they've got an expert and they've got a team that, you know, is expert in sales tax. And that means they've got their internal sales tax lawyer, their internal sales tax deputy lawyer, their outside counsel, their accountant, their yada, yada, yada. And you're like, hey, yeah, we, we, we collect sales tax. And they're mm -hmm. like, no, let's like, let's dig in and like really talk about it. And you're like, I. How I long did the whole process take, about. start to finish? Um, yeah, probably like a month, month and a half. Okay, wow. Um, from when we had agreed terms, month and a half uh, to close. And it's, yeah, I mean, it's seven days a week, all day, every day, uh, every hour of day and night. And, uh, what was the first didn't... thing you did when it finished? The first thing I did when it finished, um, I have to look at my calendar. I don't remember, <laughs> uh, but I, I want to say I took a vacation. I want to say that's the answer. Uh, so tired. Was, can't even remember. Just went fell asleep I, for I like a week. Remember, I can't remember <laughs> anything that happened pre COVID, but I believe I took a vacation. Like my, my standard uh, process for every look, every fundraising round is a little like this. It's exhausting, and you know, people are kind of contentious by the end of it because you know you're on opposite sides of the table. Your investors want one thing, you want another, and you know you kind of go through the, the the motions. But I think you know after most funding rounds, I've taken you know three or four or five days off and said, hey, let's just go on vacation. Like let's just take this. No, I, I know we should do the announcement. We should do all that stuff, and we'll get to that. And you know. But everyone just go decompress for like four or five days and we'll we'll get back to this. Um, and I think that's, you know, uh, it's important because you don't want to be going into the next uh, the next phase of the journey or the next round of the journey tired and exhausted. You want to be going in super excited and like, hey, let's let's go make this happen. So um, I imagine 
uh, I, uh, I imagine I took a break with my uh, with my wonderful wife at the time, uh, and she would have been she would have been pregnant, so she would have been five ish months along, six months along. So we were uh, getting ready. I think she was also at the time saying, "Hey, we need to move apartment because we we need to get out of this one bedroom." Teeny tiny. Actually, we were living in like a, a big studio, all in one thing at the time, which uh, which was not suitable, certainly for a, a kid. So, I I think we uh, we we sold the business, uh, moved apartment, and had a kid all in the space of like three months or so, or four months. Big few months for you. No wonder you can't remember. Mm, yeah, I, I kind of I'm kind of curious now. I might I might pull it up <laughs> after this and like find out what. Did I go on vacation then? Did did vacations ever happen pre-COVID? Like, was that a thing that we did? Or, or were they all, like, just in our mind? Did uh, we travel? I think there were VR headsets did, vacations. Yeah, did we travel to, like, resorts and go on vacation? Was that a thing that happened? Or did I just imagine? Oh, did I really drink that pina colada? Yeah, I really? saw a friend of mine. He's on holidays in Santorini. And I'm, like, looking at it going, he's, he's on holidays now? I just couldn't believe it. It just feels like another world. Do you have a cocktail? That's the real question. <laughs> I think he will probably. He's only there now, so he probably will in a few hours. So then you, you go into what was Angie's list at the time. What was the, the what happens when you get bought? I think that's what a lot of people don't know. What happens as a founder when you get bought and brought into a new company? Um, it depends. So what, what happened for us was uh, we were heads down. We were like, all right, you know what? We've got a great business here. Let's keep growing it. Let's you know start a, a, an early integration process to think about how we might work more closely together. Uh, but we just kept growing the business. We focused on retail, kept growing it. And the, the team there asked me a few times, hey, do you want to think about running product for the overall business? So product and tech. So I kicked that around for a while and said, yeah, sure. You know what? I'll, I'll take on running product. And it was only when, I think that might have been six months later, a year later. Um, actually, no, it was, it, was, it was six or eight months later. So it was June of 19. Um, I, um, I, I took on running product and that was when we started to integrate the business more. So that was when we started to say, hey, there's actually a ton of stuff we could be doing together. How do we sell handy services uh, on Angie and on HomeAdvisor? And that was... Uh, you know, that was an important moment to like say, hey, all right, like let's actually start to bring these businesses a little more closely together and, and, and build a common tech stack. Um, and um, yeah, it was, it, was, it, it was fun. But I mean, it, a lot of, you know, a lot of the stuff that, uh, a lot of the gritty stuff, we kind of just kick, kicked off. Uh, like we, we kicked out the, or not kicked off, we kicked out. So we kicked out the, the kind of gritty stuff that we needed to, to do around culture and values. We didn't say like, let's build a common set of values across Angie. Um, we didn't, you know, we, did, we didn't do the common mission thing. Angie at the time didn't have a mission. It didn't have values. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't set up to, um, it wasn't set up to say, hey, let's like go after shifting Handy over to this set of values and mission. Mm -hmm. And that's only something that, uh, that I took on this year. So when I took on the, the CEO role, um, one of the first things I did was kick off a work stream and say, hey, we're gonna land our values. So we're gonna land Angie wide values and we're gonna you know, uh, work those handy values into that and we're gonna like reverse those onto the, the handy team. Um, and similarly, we're gonna have an Angie wide mission and we're gonna like, you know, get focused on having a, a one company um, or one team and that was, you know, effectively three teams. Like you, you, they had, we also hadn't done that with Home Advisor, right? So we effectively had three different teams. We had Home Advisor, okay. Angie, and Handy. Um, and no one had ever done the, you know, they they'd done the payroll work, as in we're all paid from the same payroll yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. Um, they they'd done the work to make sure y'all had the same stock, and you you know all the taxes were done. But they hadn't done the the hard cultural work to say, all right, we actually need to build a common mission. We actually need to build common values. Um, and that, you know, it gets, I think, lost um, in, um, I think that gets lost times. I think founder-led companies are really good at that stuff. Like there's a lot of stuff founder-led companies aren't good at, um, but I think founder-led companies are really good at, um, founder-led companies just really good at saying, you know what, gotta lock the mission, gotta lock the values. If we don't have that, it's really hard to, it's really hard to do 
uh, a lot of different things. Like it's hard to run all hands. It's hard to have like difficult conversations because you don't have any pillars to go back to. Mm, like when people start you. to ask yeah. difficult questions about like wh why we're doing certain things and like why we're doing X versus Y, why we're not supporting, you know, this cause versus that cause. You don't have any pillars. You don't have any framework to say, hey, like actually we've, we've got <laughs> we've got scaffolding in which to have this uh, to have this debate um, and in which to, you know, to build our, our position. So um, I think it's, you know, it, mission and value is just critical. I think that once we, once, once we put that in place earlier this year, everything just got a lot easier. Um, I'm conscious of time. We've just a, a couple of minutes left. I want to ask you just about the last kind of 16 months or so running, well, becoming CEO and then running a giant business during COVID. What, what has that been like for you? Stressful, but fun. Uh, the, 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 the fun part is, um, a lot of what we talk about, the opportunity to, to really set the mission, mm. to really set the values, to build a team that is focused on the right things, to build a team in a way that, you know, you feel really good about, uh, to bring in, uh, to bring in a set of, you know, a set of objectives and a way of talking about what we're doing that makes it easier for people to make decisions. And then, you know, the, the challenging part is, Look, it's just hard. A lot of volatility. Mm. Like, you know, whether it's the mess of, hey, should we open our offices? Should we not open our offices? Should we do in-person events? Should we not do in-person events? Um, and, you know, the, you're also in a, in a, in a challenging uh, macro environment where, uh, you know, the, the, the business itself, um, you know, it, it's just incredibly volatile during this period. You know, we've, we've probably had the sharpest decline in consumer demand ever followed by the steepest return in consumer demand for home services ever mm. and at the same time the sharpest reduction in pro supply as people said whoa whoa, whoa i don't want to do any work yeah. um followed by um i i don't know if it's if it's happened in ireland but a a, a pretty serious uh dislocation in the actual supply chain where you know cement steel concrete uh, you know, building materials that the factories didn't run for a period of time, then yeah. demand exploded, they tried to run them again, they didn't have all the, you know, it all just got uh, pretty messy pretty quickly. And uh, we've, you know, been dealing with just a lot of spiky behavior. Um, and then you layer on top of that, the, 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 the shift towards remote work, you know, before this, we had five plus thousand people all in offices pretty much every day. Uh, now we've got all those folks working at home. Um, you know, we've, I think we've all gone through the, hey, are we working too much? Do we have Zoom fatigue? To, oh my goodness, is anyone doing any work? Uh, are we doing enough work? To, all right, what's that middle ground? And how do we, you know, how do we think about the fact that, you know, on, on any given, you know, uh, year, a certain percentage of people are relocating. So are we allowing those people to work from wherever they're working forever now? Like, what do their lives look like if you want to work from Tampa, but you originally lived in New York? Are we, you know, are, are we embracing that? And I think in any, you know, in any scenario, it, it's about making sure that you go back to the mission. It's like, all right, how okay. do we anchor people yeah. back to this is what we're trying to accomplish. We want to help our customers get the job done. We want to help our pros grow their business. Uh, and if we do that, then the, the rest of it will figure itself out. So I think that's been the, the common theme that we've kind of just leaned back into again and again. It's all right, there's a lot of volatility. We understand that your life might be volatile. We understand the macro might be volatile. Um, but the more, uh, the more we've like gotten the team back to like, all right, just focus on the knitting. Like, let's just get back to what we actually know about. Let's get back to what we're good at. Uh, and if we do that, the rest will figure itself out. Um, and sometimes, you know, I, I, sometimes I get lost on that and I need to be pulled up. It's like, Hey, like, what are you doing? Like, don't, don't, don't go stressing out about like what remote work tool we need to use to like do X, Y, Z, just get, you know, get, get back to the, uh, get, get, get back to the core. Um, yeah. That's kind of what, that's my second last question for you. Actually. My last question is to recommend a book. So you can just think about that for a minute. Something that's made an impact on you either personally or professionally. I can see them all stacked behind you. So I should have a good answer. The second last question is, you started to touch on it there. How, as a business leader, how do you filter out the signal from the noise, from all that, that like you touched on it there, so many things happening, it's such a fluid environment. As a leader, how do you pick out the bits that's actually the signal? I, I, I think there's, 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 there's a few different parts, right? One is, it's the easy part. It's, 
does it get close to the mission? Does it get close to the, you know, the five things written in the book um, that's like important to me this year? And if it does, then it's like, all right, like let's, let's zero in on it. Um, the, the only counter to that is like some tiny part of your brain needs to be opportunistic and remember, all right, like even if there are things that don't, uh, that don't, uh, that, that don't hit the immediate five goals I've got, if they opportunistically drive at, you know, our long-term mission for the business in a massive way, I don't mean like, oh, they'll get us 2% closer. It's like, oh, does this accelerate us by a year or two years? Then you listen for those opportunistic things. Um, but they have to be huge. Like the things that you're listening for, they either have to be very relevant to the five things on your list, or they have to be like, oh my goodness, you know, there's an opportunity to buy this company at, you know, 2% of the value or 10% of the value that we think it could add to us. Like, all right, let's, let's constantly be listening for that. But you know, you, you don't want to have too many of those thoughts in your head at any, uh, at, uh, at any moment in, uh, in, in time. Keep referring back to the five things. I'm going to do that I exercise do, yes. right it's, back. Look, you need filters. You need yes. ways in your life to get rid of, uh, get, get rid of the, 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 you know, the distraction and, you know, I think the best people, whether they're, you know, sports people, whether they're artists, musicians, whatever, they have their like, all right, this is getting me closer to my goal. This is getting me closer to the thing that I think I'm good at. This keeps me in my box. Like you hear, you know, you hear uh, Warren Buffett talk about it. And it's like, hey, th there's, there's very few things we're good at, um, but we know what those things are and we stay really close to them. Um, and it's like, you know what, that's helpful get really good at those things. There's alternative, you know, schools of thought, which are, Hey, like develop your weaknesses. I'm probably, you know, past that where it's yeah. like, you know what, I know what I'm good at. Let me just like double down on the strengths. <laughs> Maybe if I was, you know, my two year old who, you know, has a lot of things she could work on. And I'm like, yeah, I'll help you develop your weaknesses. <laughs> I'm like, you know what, let's just get really good at the things we're already like pretty, not pretty good at. It's like um, that book doesn't make the boat go faster. I always think back to that. It's a great, great title. Um, yep. Final question. Speaking of books, do you have a book that's made an impact on you personally or professionally? Um, I'll lean into uh, the hard thing about hard things. Um, I, I connected with me. I, I might have read it at a time when uh, when I, when, you know, the, the, I think the, the, the part in it that resonates with me the most is probably the wartime versus peacetime CEO. Um, and, uh, I, I probably read it at a moment in Handy's journey when, uh, we were, we were more wartime than peacetime. And I think it gave me confidence fuel to, to, to go and, uh, to go and make decisions that were, were helpful at the time. So that's the, the, the one that sticks out for me. Uh, the one that sticks out for me today. Brilliant, Dushin. Thank you so much for your time. I know you're super busy. Thanks for taking the time. Where can people either connect with you or learn more about Angie? Twitter, Oshin Hanrahan on Twitter. Brilliant, Oshin. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Great questions. Enjoy your day. I hope you enjoyed that chat with Oshin Hanrahan, the CEO of Angie. I got a massive amount from it from a leadership point of view and from an entrepreneurship point of view an all around good guy. I look forward to catching up when he's back in Ireland. If you're watching on YouTube, please drop me a comment below. Let me know what you thought. This was our first interview series done on video. So I'm really keen to get your feedback. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, drop me a comment on any of my social media channels. They're all the same. Mr. Gary Fox, MR Gary Fox. I look forward to chatting to you then. I'll be back here next Monday with the latest version of the Idea Lab. If you like that kind of content, you can subscribe to my channel here or you can watch my most recent video here. I'll see you back here next Monday.